Hello and welcome to another episode of the Film Mavericks Podcast. I'm your host, Jordan Bunch, and I am thrilled today because I am talking with Dallas Taylor. Dallas leads de facto sound, uh, which is a sound design company that works with everyone from small production companies like my own um, to, you know, giant advertising spots for Google, Facebook, Adobe, BMW, Nike, Alfa Romeo. Uh, they also do trailers for, you know, huge studios like HBO, AMC, Cinemax, a e Nat Geo, Discovery, Nickelodeon, Cartoon Network. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. It's ridiculous. Uh, their work is really unbelievably mind-blowing. So uh, I'm thrilled because of that. But he also hosts and executive produced the world's leading podcast, about sound. It's called 20,000 Hertz. Uh, they have uh, an amazing audience. They have uh, over 2 million downloads. So you should totally subscribe if you're not already. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that is uh, that is a great intro here from my guest. Hopefully that, that sets them off on the right, the right place. So Dallas, thanks for coming on, man. Well, thank you. I'm I'm curious what like your fee would be if I just hired you to just go in front of me in life and just introduce me to everyone. <laughs> we got to have be a soundtrack to that as well, though. That's, oh, of course, that's yeah. Really well sound designed. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, all of that sounds right to me. Um, the one little fact that's pretty neat, and and you know, I'm worried about sounding like a, I don't know, jerk or arrogant or whatnot. Is it's actually two million downloads. Over two million down- downloads just last year. So over the course of the podcast, oh my gosh. Um, it's like I think it's like seven million so far out of two That's years, awesome. two two and a half years or something. So yeah, the two is like I don't know eight months or something. So uh, all of that to say is that people have really responded well to sound. Um, yeah, I think that sound. I'm just gonna kick it off here. Um, Go for it. Sound is really one of those things that people don't think about. It's been just kind of swept under the rug, and I kind of get that constantly. That like, oh, it's just the audio. Let's let's sweep it over there. Um, oh, that's just the audio person kind of needing something. So let's sweep it over there. Um, what I found out just through having a business for, for 10 years before that, um, starting a podcast that is completely devoted in every way to sound, telling stories about sound, telling stories behind certain sounds that we all know. What I found out is, is people love it. Like people are, are gobbling it up. So, so people Mm. are into sound, lots of people, normal people, people who are not audiophiles. And so um, that's what's really exciting about this is that uh, that I feel like um, as a team, as far as on the podcast side, we've really like kind of stumbled into something where mass audiences are into. And um, but but yeah, so that's kind of on the podcast side. So twenty thousand hertz, all spelled out. Check that out. But yeah, let's talk about some uh, some some sound design stuff. That'll be fun. Absolutely. Okay, so we have we have a really broad audience. I've learned, you know, we have we have people who are seasoned veterans that are running studios with you know dozens of people involved and we also have people who are just sort of starting out and trying to make a go at this as a career Um, so we have people kind of all over the spectrum and one of the things i've learned is you actually kind of just gave testament to this is that people even all along that spectrum i think um oftentimes avoid sound design you know it's like um, well, maybe music and dialogue is enough. Um, so first, just for those people who this would be totally a new topic for, tell me what sound design is. Yeah. So sound design is really, at least the way that I, um, define it, which is not traditional by any means. Uh, the way that I see sound design is really kind of like designing everything from a sonic perspective outside of music. Um, now that's a stretch because traditionally sound design is only the artistic elements of something. So a dinosaur roar Mm. or an alien spacecraft over time, that's of course, I've always thought that as being sound design, but over time I've thought like I'm designing in a mix, like I'm designing in the way that I process, um, the process dialogue. Like I'm designing a thing all the time and the, and the term does, excuse me, the term designer in my mind is very, uh, creative. It's a, um, it's a, it's bring, it's, it's putting that, uh, putting a seat at the table for that sense, uh, that human sense. And so, um, sound design to me is really a holistic thing. There could be composing, uh, issues, things that, that are, that are sound designy or sound design focused. Composers could make an argument in, mo- in, in many cases that they are sound designing, especially when they're, when they're seeing a picture and creating. 
um, they are sound designing, they are music designing. Um, you know, when we're uh, there's there's kind of four elements of a soundtrack, or you know, that's that, I'm sorry, four elements of sound design that I think about. Um, some people would argue these are just four elements of like the sound, jo- the, the post audio team. I just don't love those terms because they're so mm. clunky and old. Yeah. Um, but you've got Foley. Those are things that you touch, uh, whether with your hands or your feet. So if I'm, you know, picking up a bag and throwing it on, you know, throwing a backpack onto the ground, that's something that we typically will perform to picture because that takes a, um, a sensitive touch uh, right. because, you know, we can make someone sound angry or weak just in the way that we do Foley. Mm. Um, you've got backgrounds. These are things like wind and birds and just things that like kind of fill a scene in general. Um, we have, and you know, that's something that we can make sound ominous or dissonant or happy or pleasant. You know, we, it just in the backgrounds, we can make a project sound like really pleasant and, and nice. Uh, but you can also put things, uh, that's very eerie. Um, for example, I just saw first man the other day and the very, the very last scene is like ambience and it's so dissonant because of like a, a marriage that's just like dissonant. And it was just like Mm. telling a story in just ambience. So the third thing, what do we got? We got Foley. We've got um, we've got backgrounds, uh, hard effects. These are things that are like door slams, explosions, things that we've recorded at some point or have acquired through a sound library that we can build onto. Um, you know, a lot of like weapons or like you know, again, a door slam or a car door slam or a car buy, things like that. We can build from existing libraries. Um, most of the time, when we're building things, it. it it can be a single element, but it could be 10 elements that sound like one element. Mm. Uh, and then the last thing is, at least what I like to think about as the fourth element, uh, is the emotional uh, sound elements. Mm. So in that case, you've got things like cymbal whines, if something is kind of creepy. You've got boom hits, like trailers, you know, if you want something, somebody to feel, um, you know, like they, like they got punched in the gut, uh, you know, a boom or something. I think it was one of the beginning of the the Batman movies had this like first shot where like it just like you're overlooking like you're falling down into like Gotham City and then they just go like mm. like in it. So that's like a punch in the gut um, type of thing uh, or just any trailer in general. So those are very emotional designed effects. We probably spend, due to what we do, we probably spend most of our time on the emotional. I mean, take, granted, we do lots of Foley, lots of backgrounds, lots of hard effects. Um, but I think that uh, we, we really kind of pushed far into the emotional sound design uh, in general. So those are really like the four elements of sound design. Outside of that, you have dialogue, which can also kind of encompass voiceover. Um, and then kind of in the on the other spectrum, you have music, which is something that we only really do music if it can also be confused as sound design. Hmm. Typically, we don't do like music tracks because we think that there's amazing like music libraries out there. There's amazing composers that we want to keep employed. Everyone is really subjective about that. And so uh, that's something that's really personal. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, so I like to. I also think that composing and sound design are just two different parts of your brain. They are both creative, but when you when you're only you know trying to do the best job you can in one or the other, you put those things together and then you mold it together and it just turns into something um, amazing. So yeah, so that's that's generally like kind of what elements we're thinking about on a daily basis. Yeah, that's incredible. I love that. So for for someone who maybe has a a smaller company like mine, you know we have. 12 people in our studio we're producing um you know branded content for people and that sort of thing what and and i think that's you know our audience kind of falls you know somewhere along that that sort of spectrum of what i what i talked about earlier so for someone like that um why why spend all this time on sound design give me give me sort of the, the argument for why they should do that versus what they have maybe typically done which is primarily you know, um, throwing down the, the dialogue track and m- making the edit and, um, you know, kind of hitting that with the beats of a song. Yeah. And there's not to say that lots of certain videos need that. Um, you know, what's important is, is communicating what story needs to be told, uh, whether that's your story or something you're making, or if that's a corporate story, that's something that they're doing. You know, I would say half of what we do is still mixing very, very straightforward spots because, you know, it's about communicating a message from one from point A to point B. So, um, so it's definitely not to confuse that everything needs to have some sort of mega sound element. 
but everything does need to be thought about in the sound uh, world. And the reason being is because as visual storytellers, we tend to get, obviously we're visual, we're very visual creatures as humans. And so we naturally are inclined to be extremely visual but when we go into a visual medium, because there's cameras involved and shoots and all that stuff, it becomes hyper focused on visuals. And we forget that we have five human senses and that the only two that we have in, in visual, at least in the filmmaking and, and corporate and, and all of those things, the only two we have are, are is, is what we see and what we hear. And so the hearing part is just kind of it just grossly under thought about. Yeah. And it, it's also been a world culturally, we got to remember that like filmmaking is relatively new. And so while it's easy to just look back and go, they, they have it all figured out and this is the way the world is. And this is the way that we, this is the workflow that we do. We do this first, we do that second, we do this third. The reality is, is we're still, we're in a like renaissance of how to make content right now. And so, um, so just, I'm not saying think less about visuals because everyone should think very seriously about visuals. Um, but the, but the thing that I am saying is that people are always looking for a secret weapon, if you will, of how to tell a more, um, powerful story. And I see it, at least in my position, um, working with, I mean, last year we worked with over a hundred different, uh, groups uh, of people. So the, you know, multiple people within those groups, but a hundred and something different groups. And what I'm seeing is that when people are thinking about sound and when because sound is something that starts at conception not shoehorned in at the end um their clients the people they work with the people they're trying to please can't put their finger on kind of what makes them like in this next world than their competitors but on our perspective it's really obvious it's just like they've cared about sound from the moment they were on you know writing something all the way through post and we are just executing a plan that they put in place a long time ago yeah and just to kind of segue into another thing that i think is really important to say is that also this industry has been you know audio files audio types of people in general have been um i don't know like kind of these like magicians in dark rooms with like ponytails that you like don't <laughs> mess with nothing wrong with ponytails uh, i had long hair in my i've had ponytails in my past in the past but um but but they've been like unapproachable like both on the consumer side with audiophiles like i know better than you because i can hear something that you can't and then you know, on the flip side you have um you know kind of the traditional post audio person that's that's just that like angry person that's been worked to death that will get it done in in you know 30 minutes and like you know just don't poke the bear um with that, it's it's kind of had a culture of like, as a filmmaker, as an editor, as a writer, as a producer, whatever, you're not allowed to think about sound. That's crazy. Like, th without the people on the front end making sound opportunities along the way, there's nothing that on the back end shoehorn that's going to be this magic sauce that we just kind of sprinkle on it and then suddenly it's great. Hmm. I'm not saying that you can still be a little bit hazy by the time you get there, but just have faith that like something is going to kind of enhance. But... Um, all of that to say is like, you don't need an invitation to start thinking about sound, just like you didn't need an invitation to take your wife or girlfriend or, or, you know, husband, uh, or boyfriend out to a nice restaurant because it was, you know, because you wanted to appeal to a sense of taste. You didn't need an, need an invitation for that. The, 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 you know, most of the time waiters and people that you go in there are, are just happy to kind of share that experience with you. Um, and you don't need an invitation to cook great food even if you're not a chef. And so that kind of trickles into every sense, you know, uh, that, that goes into the taste or I'm, mean, I'm sorry, the, uh, the smell, like you don't need an invitation to put a candle out. Um, <laughs> but for some reason, when we think about sound, we go like, Oh no, like that's just for the audio magicians to like, think about. And that is just completely and utterly wrong. Hmm. Some of the most creative people I know, like, and I work with so many amazing humans, like these are visual people, but they, you know, they were, musicians they were artists they were you know on the side they paint or on the side they write it's like they have just as every right to start thinking about sound and using it creatively as i do um and once you kind of have a collaborator that's doing that to begin with and then we move into a process together through communication or hey let me let me bounce something off of you is this doable then you take the, the it to like magic land like nothing i would say on our website or what we've put out the, the most elite type of like soundy work that we do 
none of that was just passed along from an aloof editor or an aloof director that was just like, okay, you just guys go make it magic. Like, no, they thought about it from the beginning. I would say, I would argue in a lot of cases, they deserve equal, if not, you know, 60, 70% of the sound design credit because they're laying the Mm -hmm. foundation and then we are executing that plan. Um, So all that to say, to put it in a real nice little neat uh, ribbon, a little bow is you don't need an invitation to start thinking about sound. You don't need an invitation to start creating with sound. Well, I think that's one of the things about a really good sound design is if you're not if you're not in production, if you're just a consumer of uh, you know of the media, then you're not so much going to think about it. It's it's not going to be something that uh, you know you 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 notice in the same way that you might notice visuals. However, it will change the way that you feel about what you're watching it will change you know change your emotion about it it will change um you know the the impact that the visuals make and so um i think that maybe you can speak to that a little bit in the ways that um that that good sound design is maybe not noticed as much by people who aren't really into it but that it still makes an incredible impact i think we can make that argument for visuals as well uh, because yeah. you know all of my friends are 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 you know, you know most of my friends lots of my friends are filmmakers they're dps they're directors they're writers um they're people generally like like probably the people who are listening right now who think a lot about cameras and are probably very frustrated if they show to some people and they're like oh my goodness you see this new camera and you see this and it's like eh i don't know they both look good yeah um, my webcam looks good your webcam looks amazing, which is a DSLR, which I learned. Um, <laughs> some people will be able to, um, by the way, we're, do, we're doing this in video too. I mean, you might be listening in audio, you might be in video, blah, blah, blah. But, but go to YouTube and watch, <laughs> it, and watch it there instead. <laughs> yeah. So all of that to say is like people think that certain things are good enough. I have a $200 webcam that looks great compared to five years ago. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. But to someone who has a fifteen, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 camera, it's it's like oh that's trash but like i don't think normal people are going yeah oh dallas's webcam is trash no they just accept what it is and so that's the same thing with the filmmaking thing i don't really think in on the consumer side it's any different than visuals because i think it's easy for like <clears throat> people just accept if something's not colored like oh that's just the way it is they're not thinking oh that needs to be more colored they just don't know the they don't know any better right and when they see something that that you know a netflix original versus Oh man, I don't <laughs> got to be careful with this. I will not name any sort of names because we have so many different uh, clients, but um, <laughs> the difference between a Netflix original, something that's shot, even a reality type show versus a insert, a reality TV uh, cable network of your choice. There's a reason that Netflix stuff looks better. It's because all those little things have all added up and even the consumer can tell. And so mm-hmm. let's even rewind to production. Um, this is an argument. This isn't even an argument for solely just sound design at the end. This is an argument for for taking things further in production because everything in production, everything in I would say every almost every piece of content out there lives and dies by how well dialogue was recorded. Like mm. everything, um, nothing can happen to the to an extreme level unless you have incredibly beautifully recorded dialogue. To the point where I can tell different audio mixers in <clears throat> in like documentaries and stuff. I can tell if like one mixer did this and another mixer did this because you can just tell the quality update <clears throat> on certain things. Um, there's things you can do in production like right away to make things better. I mean, um, very simple things, which most people are probably already doing, but you know, things like hums and, and refrigerators, like put your keys in the refrigerator, pull the plug on the refrigerator, <clears throat> uh, turn off the AC. Those key, those keys, when you leave, will remind you to, to put those things back on. There should be nothing. Uh, when you, when you're in a, in a room that's very reverberant or sounds like a closet or sounds like a bedroom, an empty bedroom or something like that, uh, in all those, those places where you can't see anything on camera, put up some C stands and drape some big sound cloth blankets, like soak that stuff up. Because if we get a super clean or even if you without going to post audio, gets a super clean recording, you can always add that stuff back in, but you can, I mean, you can kind of take it away, but it always is artifacty. 
Mm. So, um, so soaking up sounds, I mean, I've seen, seen a lot of, uh, really high end sound mixers lately, just like putting big drapes of like sound blankets on C stands in every nook and cranny that's off screen. Um, and it, and it really shows, um, uh, again, like when the attitude of infinite budget for a camera, but Ooh, a thousand dollars for a microphone. Like that's got to stop. Like yeah. we're in a, we have two senses in life in this, in what we do. And, um, and it's just imbalanced to like just do the cheapest possible thing in audio, but like have a not a, a mindset of the sky's the limit in video. Um, I think that this is a very common phrase, like very common idea that you could. Um, so I'm not. This is not my idea. I just hear it all the time. Like you can have a pretty trashy video, but if you have incredible audio, like it, it takes things to another place. Um, yeah. Hence a lot of movies, uh, but I'm not arguing against camera stuff. I'm just arguing against the mindset of like audio is this just little tack on thing. Like no, like audio, your sense if you lost your hearing versus your 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 sense of sight. Like I don't think it's a one is better than the other. It's just it's just they are equal in a lot of ways. So um so I don't know. I'm just ranting. You know, it's just like I'm in my element, loving this. Like yeah, give me on another rant. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Well, maybe. I think this would be interesting because you've worked on so many different amazing projects. Talk to me about a super challenging uh, project that you guys had and maybe, you know, sort of unpack that, how you guys approached that, that particular project. Sure. Um, first of all, I'm going to give credit where credit is due because um, we have just an incredible team of people. So it's uh it's a it's a holistic approach for with with how we are um so i don't want to take any sort of like personal credit i feel like i steer the ship a lot i think about the highest level creative a lot um but we have um three other sound designers and uh, a producer sam um so nick colin jai me sam who are just like this like holistic sound force that just kind of pushes things in into the ether so um just to say, um, traditional audio, traditional post has been this very insular pillar where it's like this one person all by themselves. And I've fought against that my entire career. And that's why I started de facto. So everything we do is kind of like touched and thought about and listened to by multiple people in the circle before we even push things out. Um, so as far as challenging things, um, Oh man, there's so many different elements because uh, we've worked on so many different like trailers. We've worked on promos. I would say on the most, uh, I'll do it in different genres. How about that? Um, sure. Yeah. Advertising. Ninety nine percent of the time, the challenge is personalities, mm. and um, typically they have the money, but and there's amazing ad agency people. There's amazing amazing ad agencies, um, but there's still an acceptance of this like. God creative type that kind of floats in on their like, you know, creative carpet and then just graces <laughs> us with their creative like <laughs> adjectives or something. That's the stuff like, I, it, like that's the stuff that's challenging for us. Like when we smell yeah. the, like when the BS meter just like starts pegging immediately on a personality, we're like, Oh my goodness. Like, do we really want to do this? Yeah. And there, I will say that there are many times we very sneakily pull ourselves out of those situations. Like for some of those things just are not worth even if it's a high budget, like some of those things are not worth the emotional toll that it puts in, in our, in our world. You know, we are, um, a very tight knit sound design group. We care about each other's, you know, personally, we care about each other, um, you know, work life balance. Um, you know, that's a totally different topic, but, but I care about people being happy, like in their life in general. And so, um, so poisonous personalities getting, get like permeating our, Oh, that's uh, poisonous personalities permeating <laughs> our studio. That doesn't work. Um, it's just not, it's not worth it. Um, I'd rather have a, he a healthy, happy team. Um, so personalities on the advertising side is really it. And then uh, the, the other challenge really is not the creative. It's just being okay that, that the agencies and the clients do know to an extent what they need more than you do as a creative. That is a service industry when we're talking about advertising. It's easy to kind of get on the high horse of like, I'm the creative and you hired me and this is my vision. But like, no, we're, right. we're a janitor cleaning up their floor. We're like, mm -hmm. nothing wrong with being a janitor. Like it's just, you're a service, you're a service to another company. So do your best, put your best foot forward, put your, you know, put your creative into there, make, try to sell it. Sometimes it's get sold. Sometimes it gets pulled back. 
And the challenge is really, and I don't think we have this uh, this problem at all. The challenge is really just not getting all like <sighs> butt hurt about it. <laughs> you know, it's just yeah. like it's just part of the world. That's just the way. You know, that's what they need. And we go, okay, great. We'll we'll re we'll readjust here, and we'll pull back, and we'll do this, or maybe we'll go for more, or whatever. Um, on the television promo side, which is you'd kind of think would be close to like advertising, but it's really not. Like mm-hmm. when you're doing like um, promos for any of these like cable networks, or um, I mean, we're fortunate enough to work with HBO; they're incredible. I would say that like on the promo TV world, they're generally amazing people. Like they're because they they are so overworked that they just have to like crank stuff out all the time. Right. But I don't think that like a like a really there's not many toxic personalities that can get away with that in those worlds. So I'd say the challenge in promos is the speed at which people are trying to promote content. They do an amazing job of like creative in those situations, but the the sheer speed of how fast you have to get stuff out for air um, right. sometimes takes gets as a sacrifice to the actual um, creative. And most everyone in promos wants to push creative, but sometimes they get stuck in a box where it's just like, well, I mean, we've kind of established this tone. We just have to make it get this stuff cranked out where we can think about the next thing and the next thing. So that's right. a challenge there. It's still not a like a, an audio challenge by any means. I mean, I will say, okay, trailers. Okay, now we got advertising trailers and. Um, and uh, promos. Um, the challenge there in audio is the specs because everyone wants the things to be very boomy and heavy and over the top when we're doing right. that stuff. Problem is, is like network and and like advertising audio specs force us not to do that. <clears throat> now we have ways to kind of like force some of that booms and hits, and sometimes we have to kind of like if it's a big enough thing. Sometimes we have to just go like, well, you know, this is what we need to do, and we'll float it out there, and sometimes it works even if it's kind of like slightly out of spec. Um, yeah. But uh, but there's no like spec box, and I'm sure this is the case in video too. There's no like perfect spec box that like is going to be able to encompass all creative. And so there's lots of, you know, one out of every 20 projects we do, it's like we have to really stretch spec just to make it what it needs to be. You know, for example, like, you know, a documentary that needs to be very tight where someone can hear it on a low volume from their kitchen is the same spec as doing a, you know, like a Game of Thrones battle trailer. Like, there's no way you're <laughs> going to put those two in the same box. Right. But, you know, it's just kind of knowing and communicating and, and having good rapport with the people that you work with. Um, okay, so those are those things. Documentary side um, that we do a lot of. And, like, maybe branded content documentary, whether it be five mm-hmm. minutes or 90 minutes. The challenge is there. Um, ooh, there's some good people on that side. Um I think that I, I enjoy that stuff so much because it's such a like, I don't know. Generally, it's like everyone's so kind. Um, I will I will get a pra- give a practical thing though. This was a few years back, so um, we we were really fortunate to work uh, on a a documentary that won Sundance and it won Sundance in both um, <clears throat> the Grand Jury and it won the Audience Award, which is super wow. rare. It was by Steve Steve Hoover, incredible director. It's called Blood mm, Brother, yeah. incredible film, and I think it's on Netflix or at least it was for a long time. Highly yeah, recommend. Think, yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's on Amazon Prime too. Really? Steve yeah. Hoover's, he's incredible. It's just an incredible, it's one, it's like, <clears throat> there, we've done a lot of documentaries, a lot that are great, but this one in particular was so like ground level with just a, a bunch of scrappy kids, like including myself. Like we were all just trying to figure it out. Like it was all like at, you know, budget started to come along over time. Like we were able, like they were able to kind of like pay and get things going, but it was like all started as this like scrappy operation where he's going to go film his friend who's um, doing this stuff in India. Um, Well, the thing that I learned in that is restraint and it was, it was restraint on the part of the director. There's some horrible things that happen in that film to, to children uh, with death and just unfortunate. These, a lot of these, these, these orphans have AIDS and things like this. And, um, we sounded, I, you know, me and my team sound designed it and went over the top and like, and, you know, if there's death, big hit, like, you know, really impacting people constantly. Um, seeing him absorb the entire film as we interpreted it and then slowly started to peel every layer and, and think methodically about every layer to the point where we were, you know, three days into it, we were in our final mix last day uh, where Steve, we get to a scene and Steve, we listen through it. He's like, okay, great. Um, just go back and can you just play it without music just to hear what it sounds like? And then we go, I go back and I was like, oh, I guess he just wants to hear the environments or maybe pick something that maybe he couldn't hear because the music was playing. And he pulled it, moved forward. And he was like, okay, great. Let's move on. And, um, and I was like, wait a second, do you want me to turn the music back on? And he was like, oh no, 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 we're just going to cut it. And I was like, you don't cut music like at the last <laughs> second in the last day of a mix, um, on a whim. And, um, just what I learned is like, 
he was creative and he, and he all the way to the very end. And he knew when he was overselling music in particular and sound design. Mm. Cause he pulled back a lot of our stuff. Like, do you really need like, honestly, like if, if a child is hurting or dying, do you really need the sound designer to, to kick you in the gut to, to point it out? Like, mm. no, that's an, that's so emotional and so heavy. Do you need a composer to put a blah in or like a, like a like a bass dive or like a big hit to point out that this real child is in is is hurting no so so the restraint of knowing when the actual realness of what's happening on screen is actually translating to a to another human one thing to think about and and I think that goes along with it we got to remember how biased we are in our own worlds like as open minded as we all think we are when we pick a track of music we are picking it on our own world view and so we are boxing things into the people who are like us, who think like us, like us, who have had uh, life experiences like us. And so we got to be really careful with how and where you use music. Um, and so uh, with that, like it, it's easy to just go like we're going to put like this big sweeping like stringy track that with oohs and ahs and da 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 da. But like you have to realize that you are starting to alienate other types of people because it's very hyper focused on like where you are the center of the bullseye of that you know, demographic, if you will. So I'm not arguing no music, but I will say that what, ha why that film, one of the many reasons that film did so well is because Steve didn't hold your hand and tell you what to feel the whole time. Mm -hmm. He told a story where any, anyone could come to it. The music was so, was, was not subtle. It was, it was, it was overt at times, but there were m big major moments that, that instead of even telling you how to feel, he sucked it all away. All of your life experiences could come to the table in that moment and you could feel it based off of what you've experienced because you didn't have, you know, an acoustic guitar, which you hate, like blaring through and telling you how to feel about the whole thing. Now, some people might love an acoustic guitar, but like some people don't or like a synth patch, like, you know, an, you know, an 80s emotional like synth track. Like, sure, you might like that, but like that might be a total trope to like, 50% of other people. So that's, yeah. that's something that I learned just about music is just being very intentional, very, uh, understanding of your own biases and also understanding when you need to clearly tell someone how to feel and when you need to let them feel for themselves. Um, one last point on that. And I'm talking about short films in particular, something that I see on almost every short film, you know, you, you create a short film, you write, you write it, you know, you're really happy with it. You, you tweak it, you do all this stuff. Over the course of a year or two, you finally get, you know, those weekends to do it. You put it together. Um, you know, then you spend a year um, cutting this thing together. By this point, you know this story. You've listened to this story. You've heard this story. You've, you've, re you've watched this story in your head a thousand times. How do you keep making it better and better and better and better and better? Okay, you start swamp, like smothering it with music. All the impactful moments where there's a reveal, I see this all the time. Like there's a reveal that happens, but what happens is, is over the course of editing it and going through it 10,000 times, people start selling the reveal way too early. Like they start putting that sweeping string in like 15 seconds before something happens because they want mm -hmm. to start pushing you into a place where you could be 10 times more surprised by letting it like play out on screen and then starting to support that. Yeah. So selling things too early, um, because you know, what's coming that first reads are, are so valuable. Um, that's something that we try to do a lot is like when I watch something for the first time that someone has toiled over 10,000 times, like I not only talk about sound, but generally I'll have a conversation about where I am being surprised and where I'm not and where things might be a little wonky and where, you know, prep definitely with a sound bin. So, um, so yeah, in emotional type of stuff, selling things in sound too early. I see that uh, literally like nine times out of 10. Yeah, no, I, I can think of, I was actually watching, uh, this is us with my wife, uh, a couple days ago. And th that, that show while incredible, it does that all the time where it'll set up some sort of an ambience or something, some sort of a string or whatever it is that tells you something's about to happen. And I'm just like, ah, you know, and then half the time it's like a letdown, like they're just trying to, cause they're just, that show just, I don't know if you've ever seen that show, but it's just like, it's My just this huge it. emotional roller coaster. Like it's, it's chaos. And um, I'm not, not but, speaking directly to that show, but I know my wife has told me about it. Cause she's, I finally got her to watch game of Thrones and she said, now I have to watch this is us, but yeah. <laughs> without seeing it, I think that that's a good example and a show that's incredibly emotional. It's almost like especially a network TV show where it has to answer to a bunch of like committees, not saying all do, but um, sure. 
but like it's it like it it's easy to oversell and like overindulge in music and just over like just bleh, all over like to tell you what to feel. And that stuff yep. I just kind of roll my eyes on. Um, I mean, that's why I, why I like content, like a like a Game of Thrones. You know, it's the biggest thing in the world. But there's so many times that just like out of nowhere, something just crazy happens, and they don't give it to you at all because in real life or in real battles or in real whatever, like you don't have a soundtrack to tell you what's going to happen. And I just like how like it's surprising because it's it some things un- unfold so naturally. Um, yeah. and then they support with music and then, you know, when music is in, in that show in particular is so well thought out in the way that like they use themes and the way that they intertwine themes and the way that they're really supporting an overarching thing, not just kind of spoon feeding you what to feel. Um, so brilliant use of music in that, in that show. And I think that's one of the many elements that makes that great. That's a lot of stuff that we could start at least having an idea about when we, when we come to short, more short form type of content, um, there's a lot of stuff that happens in film and high end television that um, that still hasn't trickled its way into like the creative of shorter type of projects. Okay, so give me some some advice, and maybe we can sort of tie these two things together here. Um, but I guess first, give me some advice for somebody who's really kind of just beginning to, you know, you've sold them here on the idea that they need to be sound designing their films, and they haven't before. And so this would be a brand new venture for them. So, um, yeah, give me some advice for somebody who's really just kind of like, okay, I'm, I'm going to try this on my own for a little bit and let, let's see what I can do. Like where, where to start. Yeah. You know, I think that almost everyone, the way that I see it is that almost, I don't typically have to sell anyone on it. It just, there's a natural place where every small production company or every, you know, artist or, or, you know, cinematographer or like director's DP or something, there's like a natural place where people get where set where they don't suddenly, but they start, they start creeping toward that. And they know that that becomes an issue. And so it's not, I don't think I ever have to convince most of the time. It just kind of comes out of the blue, even from places I've kind of been, you know, loosely aware of. And I know that they're not kind of doing that. I don't really like sell anybody. Uh, the only thing I do is just put out our work and say, this is what we can do. And then sometimes, you know, people respond to that. We have a, we have a, um, you know, I'll plug the Instagram account, for example. I'm really happy with the, with what we have on our website, defactosound.com. That's the the most highly curated 0.001% of our, our work. And it is everything on that website is, is there for a reason because of sound. And so it's not like, you know, we put something up because it had a great logo. It's like every single thing there was a well thought out sound experience on multiple levels. Um, but what I also do, um, which I highly recommend people doing is subscribing to our Instagram account. Really the only thing we do on Instagram other than little minor things here or there is we put out little 10 to 15 second sound design excerpts. That's where we cut music, we cut dialogue and we just like let sound design play we put those out sometimes every day, sometimes every other day, sometimes three times a week. And it's just like little snippets of just sound design. And I've seen so many people respond to that because no one like really hears sound is something you really need to hear. Mm. Um, to the point where I guess I don't really sell anything. I think people just naturally come to a point where they go, ah, you know, I've got the visuals, I've got the editing, like we're executing on so many levels, but we're just, there's this one thing that's like a stick in the mud and that's, that sound. And so um, yeah. most of those people have been doing it themselves for a while. Um, most of those people have been, you know, kind of mixing it in the box. Like I even did a course, um, five hour course, basically telling editors how to mix, like what do we, what do we do? How do you mix this kind of comparatively in the box? I did that for um, story and heart. Uh, and I think that was called, um, I forgot if you t- if you Google sound design, Dallas Taylor story or Academy of storytellers, that's it. Uh, there's a course that I did for that. Um, but, but over time, like even when people are doing it themselves, like there's, there comes a point where they're just like, this is too much work because it might take an editor to, to, to do what we can do. in you know, say three hours on, on simple projects, it may take an editor like a day and a half or a day and it still wouldn't even be great results. So when, as far as my convincing is like, get your editor back, like let your editor do the, do that work that the editor needs to do. Don't push the editor to do all of these things that are just wasting the editor's time. Pile, you know, give the editor more things to edit. Let us give you time back. So in our, you know, yeah. if it's yeah. a three to one ratio, like, you know, you send it off to us. Sure. Like in a, if you're looking at it from a microscopic level, it feels expensive compared to what you might be paying some, a full time or an hourly thing, but that just doesn't equate. Um, 
when you're really looking at a high level business or, you know, have a full time sound designer or whatever. Um, so sure, like little tiny little snippets might, might seem expensive, but you only have to pay for it when you actually need it. And, and you get time back, you can get the editor on the next thing. You can grow your business because you're delegating, um, things that you're not an expert on. Um, I don't know, just kind of, kind of gives your time back. And I see that pretty consistently. I mean, every week we have a new uh, production company that's just like, we've been doing this forever. Kind of just curious what your things are. I think most people are so timid to reach out. Um, it's kind of like a, it's a little bit of like a double-edged sword here. Like we're, we're still like a scrappy, like blue collar. Um, I'm stealing that from Evolve, by the way, if they ever hear this, like <laughs> there's, they use that all the time. They're such a, they look amazing. But they're scrappy, blue collar, love the work. You know, we're not we're not sitting behind the scenes, just can't wait to post something to our website. We're just enjoying what we're working on a daily basis with the people that we're working with, like with the collaborators. So um, I don't think that any of us are like arrogant about we need to be doing car spots all day, all, all day long. If anything, that's insufferable. Like to just be doing yeah. crazy, intense trailers and car spots all day long. Like, no, we need for our soul, like corporate spots like to sit and go oh okay we can crush this and we can make this sound better and it's not going to require like ridiculous levels of like emotion to to do it um right so yeah um i think that a lot of people are really timid to reach out but for anything every single person who's ever reached out in the history of de facto it's like a a um it just makes me happy. Like it just, anytime anyone even just like i just don't know we can afford it or whatever but like i decided like maybe you might be able to do that it's like whether we can work it out or not, it's like so unbelievably flattering when someone reaches out and recognizes that like you're good at what you do and just like it feels good. So um, so I wish that if there's one thing with how much I've worked to kind of carve a look of a company, like people have said like, oh, you do a really great job at marketing. It's a double edged sword because like, I, you know, if we put, you know, True Detective on the front page of our website, so many like smaller production go company goes like, oh, I can't, I can't work with them. They do this. And it's just like, if, if all those people still reached out, like, and we were working with even half of them, like that's going to push us forward. That's going to push the industry forward. That's going to push these production companies forward. And so, um, so yeah, if the theme of this conversation, if I was going to put something out, it's just like not, not being timid. It, you can, you can do sound, like start working it in, you know, with us, if I was to try to sell something, I'd be like, don't, don't, don't be timid to reach out. Don't be timid, timid to reach out to any sound designer that you like. If you find some, you know, a great sound designer that you think is, is doing some really killer work, like whether it's us or someone else reach out. Um, a lot of people are just flattered by that, that thought. And, uh, you know, people want, I want to help people. Another argument there is like, I've seen companies come in at like kind of the lowest rate we can get to, you know, with time. And, you know, sometimes we can be more flexible if we have lots of time. And I've seen those same companies go from kind of our basis, most base level rate, because I want to get, I want to prop them up. Cause I know that if I, pro if we can prop them up, even with like a little bit of financial, like they spend just a little bit, um, just enough to kind of get them by, I see that spark. It's a spark that kind of explodes. So I've seen many production companies come with one little project that they're really passionate about. That one little project with great sound, because they finally reached out, gets posted somewhere, and then they get 10 jobs over time off of that. And those 10 jobs turn into 100 jobs. Um, production companies all the time, like go from these little sparks to these like very intense organizations. Um, you know, due to a lot of factors, but at least I, I see all their, uh, <clears throat> a pre sound work and I see their post sound work. And as soon as they start working with sound, I, I see them often try to drop all the stuff that they, that didn't have great sound attached to it or to like try to mm -hmm. go back and remix it, but that's expensive. So, right. um, so yeah, don't be timid. Don't be timid to start, start working with, don't be timid to write sound cues. Don't be timid to, to cut in sound effects. Like in the edits, it's, you know, no one's telling you you can't. Yeah. I love it. I love it. So, um, I know we're wrapping up our time here. Um, tell me a little bit more about what you guys are doing on 20,000 Hertz. Sure. Um, so that is, uh, so the stories about the, uh, the, at least the tagline is the stories behind the world's most recognizable and interesting sounds. So, um, it's been wide ranging. We have, as of right now, we have 60 episodes out. Um, we cover topics like how, you know, what's the story behind the Wilhelm scream? which is a very, you know, filmmaker focused thing. Um, you know, there was apparently a, a, a guy who, I mean, we tell the whole story about the guy and had the circumstances and the play, the original recording and all that stuff. So we do like very recognizable mm. sounds like that. What's the story behind the NBC three note logo. Um, 
you know, stories just mm. behind audio logos in general, stories behind, um, yeah. you know, the Xbox sound, the progression, you know, why it is what it is. So those are very, like, recognizable sounds, but we also do a lot of, like, sound science. Um, for example, the last episode we put out was called Do Not Disturb. It's about notification shock. Um, we're living in the first generation of, of n- constant notifications. Uh, prior yeah. generations, even our parents and grandparents' generations, were only the only people who were notified as much as um, we are now were like 911 operators and EMTs. <laughs> and now all of yeah. us are living in a, in a world where we're constantly being notified. Even with my Do Not Disturbs up, I saw little pings popping up. Thankfully, the audio was off. Um, anyway, uh, but, but that, you know, fringe science, like what is ASMR? How's it working in our brain? Misophonia, uh, sensitivity to sound, not only sensitivity to sound, but just people who are sensory sensitive. Um, uh, even the sound of different planets. Uh, we kind of just try to try to just explore every fringe sonic place, but then also tell stories about very common things. Um, we have upcoming, we have things like deconstructing, like (laughs) the, the, like, sonic palette of like almost every movie trailer kind of poking fun of it fun at it mm, uh next yeah. episode is all about like restaurants being too loud um by the time this goes <laughs> out that might be out um you know just nice. crazy like for some reason we just accept t- ridiculously loud places um but uh but for some reason like public bathrooms can be dead quiet like it doesn't make any sense like sonically you need yeah. sound there but we don't need <laughs> blasting music in like a like a like a cocktail bar i mean yeah so yeah. anyway that's like ranty um, we have just a bunch of stuff. We have every episode for the next eight months in production, and they're all highly produced. Uh, it takes us about 150 to 200 hours uh, to make every single one of the, our 20 to 25-minute wow. episodes. So these are fully fledged, fully sound designed, fully scored. Um, audio documentary is all about audio. So it's, a, it's, it's our thing that we can just indulge in the deepest parts of the sound world um, where traditionally no other major like no one gives gives any thought to to sound and we do and so we've kind of taken the bull by the horns and commanded that genre of of sound and now we're seeing that the people are responding to it i mean as of right now uh it's 70 people per episode listen to it oh, um so it's a big awesome. deal i mean it's a it's shockingly huge for um for how for to talk about sound and i'm so flattered and and i knew that people cared about sound out there and we've just been told that they don't and so i'm proving that wrong we are all proving That's that wrong. Awesome. That's incredible. Well, man, it has been such a pleasure and uh, and an education to talk to you today. So I'm just so grateful for your time, uh, for myself, uh, but also for our audience. Uh, this has just been spectacular. So if if uh, if our audience should look anywhere else besides uh, twenty thousand hertz and just your website, DeFacto Sound, where should they go? Sure. Well, I'll give a rundown of that too. So the so the podcast twenty thousand hertz, all spelled out, no numbers. You can find that in any podcast app. Um, you know, my suggestion for that is not even go to the website. Just open up your podcast app, type in twenty thousand hertz TWE blah 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 blah. Look at it, subscribe, and just none none of the episodes are are in any sort of order. Every single episode plays on its own. So. Whether it's the latest episode or you go, oh, I want to know about the THX Deep Note, like just click on anything and just enjoy it. And hopefully you'll become, you know, every two weeks you'll listen to our new episodes. Um, on the DeFacto Sound side, um, that is DeFactoSound.com. The other most powerful place that we really spend a lot of time is Instagram. So I highly recommend Instagram.com slash DeFacto Sound. I think people really enjoy that, like just hearing sound, cool sounds and how they're, they're used. Um, those are the two key things. I'm at Dallas at DeFactoSound.com. Samantha is our producer. Um, of course, you can always reach out to me and or Samantha at DeFactoSound.com. We even have a rate request form. That's that's the thing a lot of people kind of want to find out. And we have a very like pretty short uh, request form where you can actually go to rate.DeFactoSound.com. Uh, and and it'll ask you kind of like all the, the typical questions we'd ask on a phone call. It's just in a form version. Like how long sure. is it? Where is it going to air? Like you know, what style of sound do you want with some, you know, options and stuff. So if you have something that you're kind of looking toward um, and want to kind of start getting ballparks, uh, it's something we, we receive all day long. So feel free to fill out a rate request form. So those are the key places. And, uh, and yeah, don't be timid. Awesome. Well, fantastic. Thanks again, Dallas. This has been wonderful. Yeah, thank you. It's great to great to finally connect. No doubt. All right, take care. See ya.